TCEQ's Municipal Solid Waste Management and Resource Recovery Advisory Council. I want to welcome everyone to our April 8th, 2021 meeting this morning. Uh, as always, we will start out, well, when we're in the room together, we go around the, the diocese and introduce ourselves, but uh, in lieu of that, I'm going to ask uh, Diane Barnes to call roll. And I guess Diane and I decided that uh, when your name is called, if you would please uh, indicate uh, who you represent. And Diane, if it's all right with you, I'll just go ahead and throw that one out on my part. Um, I am Holly Holder with Park Hill in Lubbock, Texas, and I represent uh, licensed professional engineers practicing in solid waste management. Okay, Trent Perez. Is Trent? I need to see if he is here. I don't see. Him. He's not okay. on yet. Okay. Okay. Scott Trebus. Trebus. I don't see him yet either. Okay. Uh, Risa Weinberger. You're on mute. I'm here and uh, I'm Risa Weinberger with Risa Weinberger and Associates and I represent, to shorten the title, I represent composters and uh, environmental educators. Okay, David Yonke. Uh, here, uh, I represent the financial community. I'm with New Gen Strategies and Solutions. Heather Douglas. Good morning. I'm Heather Douglas. I'm a representative from a private environmental conservation organization. I'm here on behalf of the North Texas Corporate Recycling Association and the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling. Kevin Martina Luck, Lick, Martina Lick. Is Kevin here? I don't see him. Okay. Uh, Cheryl Murgo. Good morning. I'm Cheryl Murgo with the Houston Galveston Area Council, and I represent the planning region. Okay. Chuck Rivette. Yeah, good morning. I'm Chuck Rivette. I work for Waste Management. I represent a senior citizen who's trapped in his home office. Uh, <laughs> but besides that, I represent a uh, professional with experience in managing a commercial solid waste facility. Jeffrey Mayfield. Hi, good morning. Jeff Mayfield, North Texas Municipal Water District. I represent a public solid waste district or authority. Richard McHale. Hi, I'm Richard McHale and I represent uh, officials from city or county solid waste agencies. Scott Pasternak. Hi, good morning. I'm with Burns McDonald and I represent the general public. Judge Dillard. Good morning, Judge Dillard, Contra County, and representing counties under 2000. Okay. Did we have anyone else enter? Okay. So, um, is has is Trent entered the meeting? How about Scott Travis? Kevin. Okay. Looks like that's our role for the council at this moment. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Um, regarding staff uh, that's uh, participating with the meeting, my name is Diane Barnes, uh, the TCQ MSW permit section. Uh, Bria, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm Bria Patterson with TCEQ MSW Permit Section. Okay, uh, Chance. Hello, everybody. Chance, Section Manager for MSW Permits. 
Charlie. Good morning. I'm Charlie Fritz, Deputy Director of the Waste Permits Division. Good to see you all this morning. OK, and then I'm going to move on to uh, our presenters. Uh, let's see if they're Amy Browning. Also our staff. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Browning. I'm an attorney in the Environmental Law Division uh, in the Office of Legal Services. Thank you. Uh, and is Amy is uh, is it Adam or Taylor? Adam Taylor. Yes, he's a uh, he's also working on this project with me. He's another is attorney he here today. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You want to go ahead all. and introduce yourself? Certainly. Uh, morning, all. I am Adam Taylor. Uh, also an attorney in the Environmental Law Division for TCEQ uh, in the Air and Waste Sections. Okay. Uh, David Greer. Hi, everybody. It's David Greer, Section Manager of the Public Education Section. And then uh, Ms. Livingston and Ms. Doughty, would y'all go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi, this is Erin Livingston. I'm with the Houston Galveston Area Council. And this is Kimberly Lyle Doughty with the Texas Association of Regional Councils. OK, Holly, I think that takes care of our major staff involved and our presenters. Great. Your introductions. Thank you, thank you Diane. And uh, later on, when we have the public comment section, if you uh, want to address the council, we'll ask you to introduce yourself and also who you represent. So we will move along. And and Chuck, I'll just say, you know, you're you can only be young once, but you can be immature the rest of your life. So <laughs> I have to follow that uh, every day of my life. So uh, with that, we will move along to Charlie Fritz, who looked like she was in a pecan orchard that's pretty far along for this time of year. And um, I will give you the uh, the calm, Charlie, and uh, you can update us on what's going on in Austin. Sounds great. Yeah, the magic of backgrounds. I can be anywhere I want to be and still in this home office. Um, so a little bit, just a couple quick updates. I don't have much. Um, jumping to the recycling stakeholder update first, um, just because it's a little bit shorter. We have internally gotten a list approved and ready to reach out of potential stakeholders. Uh, we haven't reached out yet, but that'll be coming soon um, that we'll reach out and ask for participation on this uh, this rulemaking project that uh, asking for stakeholder involvement on looking at the a holistic review of the recycling program. We talked about it last time at the last MISRAC meeting, so still the same scope of that uh, potential rulemaking. Um, uh, and honestly, we're not moving, going to move quickly on this project, at least right now um, during session. So even if we reach out in the next couple of weeks, we aren't expecting to have any sort of meetings and stakeholder meetings until um, summer. And when I say summer, I'm not, I'm talking mid to late summer. It's just um, with everything going on with a couple other rulemaking projects right now that uh, this is a priority for us, but we're just balancing our workload. So um, still going forward, but just kind of just planning it out. Any questions on the stakeholder recycling rulemaking stakeholder group? Um, and we took, I guess, from the last meeting, we took all your comments, um, definitely made some revisions to the list. Um, so thank you all for the comments, for the work, the contact names y'all gave us. And then looking at the 87th legislative session, it's definitely been, um, it was a lot less MSW this year as compared to last session. Uh, there were a lot less bills. We Anal we directly analyzed and that have a direct impact to MSW permitting. It's really uh, Darby's bill, so HB 631 um, regarding local approvals and MSW applications. That one was heard at committee on March 15th and is still pending in committee. And then the other kind of 
the ones, um, so there's the medical waste bills, the companion bills. So HB 1947 and SB 1913, they're identical. Um, those are impacting the permitting and medical waste facilities. So we're watching those. Uh, the HB1, the House bill side, is scheduled for a hearing on Monday, April 12th. And then Zaffarini has two Senate bills, 1482 and 1802, which are about MSW permitting as well. So those are the big, the main bills directly impacting MSW permitting. Uh, there's, I call them local bills, but some of them are statewide that impact MSW um, collection, transportation services, MSW services. Uh, we analyze them because we know they're important to y'all, uh, but we don't have, it's not a lot of direct impact to MSW permitting itself. Um, those are HB 753, uh, Kane's franchise fee bill, HB 2104, and SB 594. So yeah, they're on our radar, but if you had to ask us about it, our answer is kind of, we, we know they're there. We don't have a lot of input because it's not directly impacting MSW permitting. So those are the ones about kind of impacting MSW. There are a number, and I didn't write down each individual one. There are a number of agency-wide bills um, that impact air, water, and waste. Um, and those are fo this year are focusing on environmental justice. Uh, the environmental just there were a number of environmental justice bills. I say a number; it's usually more than two, and I think it was less than around five bills focusing on various aspects of environmental justice in the permitting um, in the permitting process with the agency. There were also a number of public involvement um, procedural change bills. Um, Good examples like location of public meetings, internet publishing requirements of notices, um, the agency responding to comments, and then uh, posting languages in other other than English. So a number of just revisions to how we do um, public involvement. So if, if you want a list of those, I have it, but I didn't write down the every specific number of those bill of the agency wide bills. So really, that's been that's kind of the what we've been looking at specific to MSW and then agency wide um, regarding this legislative session. We've gone, uh, like I said, that we've had one true hearing. I know Kane's bill uh, has, and a couple of others have had hearings as well, uh, but the ones that have a direct impact to MSW, we've had one hearing and then one scheduled for Monday. Any questions? Charlie, this is Risa Weinberger. I just didn't write fast enough. You mentioned um, the first time you mentioned uh, MSW permitting bills, you mentioned SB 1482 and SB 18-something. What was that? Uh, SB 1482, SB 1802. Thank you. Those were both from Zaffarini, Senator Zaffarini. Uh, Charlie, this is Dave Yonke. Uh, I know that uh, that House Bill 753 may not affect permitting directly, but do you know where it stands? You know, it's something we've followed. We've had a number of clients mention it too. Of course, they're very concerned about it. And the latest I had heard was that it could have gone to, uh, uh, I believe, a vote on Monday. I might have my terminology wrong this past Monday. Do you know where that stands at all in the process? Right now, I still have it um, left pending in committee. 320. That's, they may not have updated it. Um, and I'm trying to recall, they didn't have a meeting, environmental regs didn't have a meeting on Monday. So it'll be probably taken up on this upcoming Monday. So next Monday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Dave, just for everybody's uh, information, you want to just tell us quickly what 753 pertains to sure and you know anybody else that can dealing with it more can chime in if i get anything incorrect but the primary crux of it is that 
it would put a cap on the franchise fee at 2%. So, you know, if a municipality is charging a franchise fee on collection, Republic or waste management is collecting uh, commercial garbage or what have you, and you have an 8% franchise fee, let's say, or a 5%, it would have to be reduced to 2%. Um, so there's a drastic reduction there. We've got one client that's not a large city that they're looking at uh, over a million dollars, about one and a half million dollars in lost franchise fee income if this were to occur. Secondly, and Chuck can probably speak to this more also, but the terminology, what I read on one of the elements also seems that, and I, I'm not a lawyer, but there seems to, you know, there's always debate about franchises, exclusive franchises, legal, illegal, but you will have cities that will enter into an agreement with a hauler to pick up all the waste in that city. And it seems like this would allow for it to become an open market, um, which could be a nightmare for cities. And I'll stop there and anybody can correct me if I'm wrong in anything, but that's the crux of it. Thanks. And can I just ask, are you tracking, this is Charlie or, or anybody, are you tracking um, any of the recycling bills or the, um, uh, I'll call it a deposit bill, clean waters bill? Yeah. We're, watch we, we're watching a lot of them, um, mm. at most of them. So yeah, if there's definitely something recycling related, um, disposal waste related, but there's not a large impact to the agency or any impact to the agency, we watch those bills. Um, so we're not analyzing them. We're not doing an in-depth look at the impact to the agency, but they're on our radar. So we know when they're moving and if they pass or not. I think, Scott, did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to follow up on what Dave was saying with respect to House Bill 753. Um, so, Dave, I just wasn't sure if you were aware based on the second part of what you were describing as far as the exclusivity and the open franchises. Uh, just for everybody's benefit, originally there were two parts of that bill. The first was, as Dave described, as far as limiting what cities could do uh, to, new, to no more than the 2% franchise fee. But then there was a second part of the bill uh, that was removed uh, as a part of the hearing that happened uh, last month uh, that, that uh, removed that part that would limit cities' abilities to enter into exclusive franchises. So now it's just solely focused on that 2% franchise fee issue. Hey, thanks, Scott. Now yeah. we only have half a bad bill in my opinion. Yeah. There you go. Any other questions? You're on mute, Holly. That's all I got, Holly. Oh, I'm sorry, Charlie. I was going to ask you, if, is there anything on the uh, Zafferini bills that you said that involved MSW permitting? Uh, do you have any more specifics on that yet as to what extent it's going to impact uh, the permitting process? Those Zephyrini's two bills are refiled from last year, so they're previous ones. Um, the first one, let me get my numbers right, is um, fourteen eighty two. So SB fourteen eighty two is about uh, floodplain restrictions, uh, limiting and requiring. Um, where disposal facilities can be located and built in relationship to floodplains um, and also requiring a, a LOMER letter of map revision in addition to the CLOMER. So restrictions and requirements on that. That was 1482. 1802 is about road construction and the agency um, creating sets of rules related to how disposal facilities uh, should construct roads, access roads uh, to and from the facility. Interesting. OK. Does anyone else have any questions for Charlie? Hearing none, uh, thank you very much. And uh, you can go back to picking pecans. <laughs>
Thank you. Save me a bucket if you would. Will do. All right. So uh, next up uh, is Chance Gooden and Chance uh, going to bring us up to date on what's going on in the permit section. Yes. Thanks, Holly. Good morning, uh, Chance Gooden. Uh, and I think uh, Diane provided the uh, org chart in the email. So um, I was just going to cover a little bit about some staffing uh, that's been going on since the last time we met. So if you take a look at the org chart, uh, you currently see there is uh, four vacancies um, within MSW. So um, there are actually, <clears throat> we filled one of them uh, just uh, just last week. So their start date is on Monday. So the, that vacancy in, in team one, um, an engineer, um, they start on, on Monday. Um, that, that work leader position is still vacant and we're hoping to get uh, that one filled soon. And then um, we're in the middle of uh, beginning interviews for those two vacancies um, at the bottom. Uh, however, we have two more folks that one is retiring and one is leaving us. Bria, she's on the line. She's uh, going to start a new job with the Department of Agriculture. So we're sad to see her go, but we understand that. Uh, and uh, you know, she is aspiring to do uh, uh, more. So um, I congratulate her on her uh, endeavors. But uh, so that'll be another vacancy. So uh, we currently will have five vacancies that we're trying to fill right now. So um, in regards to projects uh, from the last time we met, um, we've gone down uh, uh, to 21 uh, major projects. Last last time we met, we had 23. So we, we've gotten two uh, registrations <clears throat> Um, issued since the last time we met. So uh, not to say that we don't have other things that are going on. I'm just giving you highlight of kind of the major long term projects that we are doing. Um, however, we we have several that we just got through um, um, doing a, a final decision on. So those are going to be in their comment period. So um, we'll have a lot of, of uh, uh, comments and public participation with those those projects. So everything has been moving along and uh, we really appreciate, um, you know, the the dialogue we've been having um, back and forth with you know, consultants and, and clients, and different things when, uh, you know, reviewing these things. It's been it's been it's been very pleasant. A lot a lot of uh, a lot of time savings that is, has occurred uh, working remotely. Um, so uh, that's a that's a plus uh, reviewing things electronically and uh, receiving them electronically. I do want to um, touch on before I go into the rule, I, I really want to touch on the council positions. As you know, it's that time again. Um, August is approaching, so we'll have six positions that the the uh, the retirement will expire and uh, just for everyone in the room, the, those are Heather, Holly, Kevin, Cheryl and Chuck. Your positions are set to expire in August. So there is another one. Um, I know that was five names I named, but there is that other one that we've never been able to fill. It's that uh, official, that uh, county official with a population of less than 150. So a notice will be going out soon, but actually the council has 10 vacancies total that need to be filled. And y'all y'all are aware that there's those four that we can never get filled along with that. Those that, those five that we never can get filled, the, you know, it's the, the elected county official that has um, any population size uh, elected city official that has uh, a population of 750,000 or more. And then there's an elected city official with a population between 25 and 100,000. And then uh, the the one that that just represents the general public. That was the one that Rosemary had filled, but she had left. So those are still vacant. And uh, we have done everything we possibly can do to get the word out um, about getting those filled. So 
if you know of some interest out there, please uh, let them know that nomination time is coming up and we would love to have their their application. And you can also nominate them as well. So we're hoping to get the notice out by the end of this month. Um, so the just go to our website. It's going to be on the MISRAC webpage where we put the information. I don't think it's up there just yet, but we'll put the application form there on the MISRAC webpage. Um, we do request that you get your application in by five o'clock on June the 1st. So if you have any questions, you can uh, contact Anju uh, Chalise and uh, you or you can email our MSW PER box and the, those emails will be directed to her to, to help you out. And we expect that the appointments will probably take place and go before our commissioner sometime this fall. So just letting you all know that that is approaching. Um, and now, uh, do you have any questions before I move on to rulemaking? Chance, this is uh, Jeff Mayfield. I just had a, a quick question on the uh, org chart. I thought I heard you say that one of the two uh, future vacancies uh, is a retirement. Are you able to, yeah. if that's the case, are you able to say who that is? Sure. Yes. Uh, Rama Yavada, uh, he is retiring uh, next week. Um, he's actually a second time retirement. He uh, retired. He's been in the regional office um, in Houston for decades um, and he retired and um, came to work for the permits, permits here and then um, um, for a while and now he's uh, looking to retire again. So he's a second time retiree. Thank you. Appreciate He's the it. one with the alphabet suit behind his name. <laughs> <laughs> He's got so many degrees. <laughs> so I, I encouraged him to write a book and part his uh, his knowledge on others by writing a book. So he loves to share his knowledge. The other the other vacancy um, that we had um, was um, a retirement as well. Uh, Alyssa Aston. Uh, she was a project manager. Um, been around for quite quite a time, quite a bit. Uh, she worked a lot in the Office of Air, but uh, she retired as well. And then the other vacancy is because um, Allison Owen, that you see there as a work lead, um, was promoted, so that made her position vacated. So appreciate that. Thanks. Uh huh. OK, so rulemaking projects as you I had touched on uh, on this last time. I just want to give you an update on the uh, chapter 332, the composting uh, rulemaking that's going on. That that's the one that it's going to amend um, the notice for um, clear and make clarifications um, to the notice, how we notice things uh, basically adjacent versus affected and then uh, some other terminology that is referenced in 332 like we still have TNRCC in there. So uh, that rulemaking is that timeline is still planned for a July proposal and uh, a January 2022 adoption. So as, as of right now, the rule team meet are still meeting and, and making those rule revisions. It's supposed to be to me by the end of this month uh, for review and uh, it'll continue on, but I would look for it to be uh, out there and uh, for public consumption, you know, very soon. Um, well, in July. So, um, and with that, I'm going to turn the rest of the rulemaking uh, projects that are going on in the agency over to Amy or uh, Adam Taylor, whichever. Hi. Um. As I said before, my name is Amy Browning. I'm an attorney in the Environmental Law Division, and we are, have been working on a rural project. Uh, a little bit of background for this one. In November of 2019, the Commission received a petition for rulemaking on our alternative language public notice requirements. Uh, the Commission accepted the petition and directed the Executive Director to look at those rules and go to rulemaking. And 
originally we had planned to propose these rules last year, but then COVID hit right after that. And so that kind of delayed us a little bit. Uh, we had three virtual stakeholder meetings in October on the rules that were quite well attended. And we proposed our rules on March the 10th and the commission um, approved the rules to move forward for publication and hearing. So I'll go over some of the highlights of what the rulemaking is proposing to do uh, and some important dates that are coming up. And then I would be happy to answer any questions that you guys might have related to this rulemaking. Uh, so this rule project will make changes to 30 TAC chapters 39 and 55. Uh, the changes apply primarily to alternative language public participation requirements for permit applications that are subject to House Bill 80, 801 from the 76th legislature requirements. The proposed rulemaking would extend requirements for alternative language notice to notices for public meetings when an alternative language notice has been required for Norian and NAFTA publication. It would require applicants to provide interpret competent interpreters for public meetings uh, when alternative language comments are received at least two weeks before a public meeting. The ED determines there's a need for such services or such services are requested by a local legislator. It would require alternative language notice to be posted on the commission's website for applications where the notice would otherwise be waived because of a lack of a suitable newspaper for traditional publication. Require that notice for air permit applications be mailed out by the chief clerk's office at least 30 calendar days prior to a public meeting. Require the executive director to provide a response to comments in an alternative language when comments are received in an alternative language. If the ED determines a community need for such a translation or if it's requested by a local legislator. When requests for contested case hearings are received in an alternative language, the executive director, Office of Public Interest Council and applicant would be required to provide any responses in the alternative language. Uh, require permit applicants to provide a brief plain language summary of their proposed projects. This summary would be translated and posted on the TCQ's website when alternative language publication is required. And then allow the chief clerk's office to transmit RTCs by mailing out notice that the RTC is available electronically on the commission's website or available to be mailed out upon request. So those are the the primary things that the, the proposed rule uh, would, would do. We have public hearings coming up on the rule. We have two virtual public hearings uh, on April 20th at 10 o'clock and April 22nd at 2 o'clock. And those will open 30 minutes prior for question and answer sessions. Uh, the end of the comment period for this particular rule is April 26th. And right now we're scheduled to go to adoption in late July. So th those are the primary things and, and the primary dates that we have moving forward. Um, we're looking forward to our uh, public hearings. Like I said, they're, they're coming up here at the end of April. We, we expect we'll have people at those. We had lots of people attend our stakeholder meetings back in October. Uh, the stakeholder meetings had interpretation services available and the uh, public hearings will also have interpretation an interpretation line available as well for those. Do you want to have any questions for for Amy before she gets attacked by that wild animal in the background? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Amy, Amy, this is Chuck Rivet. Is the is the primary trigger still whether or not the local school is required to give alternative language? Yes, sir. That that's the primary trigger. We didn't change that trigger for Nori and Napdi, and so if you had a public meeting. Uh, and, and then that would be the same trigger for whether or not you need to do your notice for the public meeting in the alternative language. I understand. And I, I, 
I just don't remember the rules on this, but we we had a we had an instance that came up about six years ago, where we had a local school that uh, triggered some fairly obscure language requirements, mm-hmm. and uh, we posted our signs and did what we needed to do in Urdu and uh, various other languages. But it turned out the school itself has an ability to file for a waiver mm-hmm. on those, and yet we don't have the ability to file for a waiver. So if the school triggers, but the school files a waiver and gets a waiver accepted, we still have to provide the alternative language. Is that is that the way it still rolls? Uh, we didn't make any changes to those requirements. Okay. So uh, we just made changes moving forward. Uh, the, the one change that we made uh, or that, that we're proposing um, for publication of, say, Nori and Napti is sometimes it's, it's not necessarily unusual, I understand, to not have a newspaper that's available in an alternative language for notice. Um, and so in, and, and so you get a waiver, right? You don't have to publish in an alternative language for Nori and Napti because there's not a paper to publish in. Uh, so we're going to have you send that notice to us so we can put it on our website so if there's somebody that needs it, they can still get to it and still see it. Um. Don't, uh, this is a rhetorical question, but I just asked you to kind of think in the back of your head. Uh, would it be something to consider to say that the local school triggers requirement for alternative language and in fact provides alternative language education? Um, so again, we, we can certainly think about it. I, I'm happy to take, you know, we comment period comments are always welcome. Yeah. Um, Again, we didn't make that change. That change is uh, we didn't we didn't propose a change to the basic requirements that that already I, existed. I, I, I understand, uh, but they've always had a waiver ability, and we never have. That's just the point. And I think the trigger, I don't remember. It's been too many years, but the trigger's fairly low, like two fifth graders or something like that. It's a very very low trigger to uh, to provide alternative language and it turns out there's many schools that trigger and file for a waiver on the basis that the trigger is so sensitive. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> hey, Amy. Yeah. When you say HB 801 requirements, the permits that meet the HB 801 requirements, we're talking the ones that have Norris and Napties. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's pretty much our, for everybody here, that's our new permits, our major amendments. Um, any others, chance? Let me scope amendments. So our, our big permits that have the two notices. And there may be some notice modifications also, Charlie. Yeah, that meet, that have Norris and Napties. Uh, I don't know. I know they have. Yeah. I know you have to send out letters and to the to the to the neighbors. That's all I know. So, Amy, if there's not the Norian, if the HP 801 requirements don't apply, because we do have some that are that have different notice procedures um, mm-hmm. that have one notice that have a notice afterwards. If it doesn't meet HP 801, these procedures do not apply. So, so HB 801 was kind of our. Um, the boundary that we kind of set and and I didn't go in and make specific changes. So we made the changes we made were the changes to chapters 39 and chapters 55. So okay. uh, these were the these are the requirements that up to this point have been found in 39 405H. And we just moved the requirements for 39 that were in 39 405H. They're getting moved to their own new section 39 426. So they'll be easy to find. And we did not change the trigger that was in 39405H. Okay. So we didn't we didn't change that what that trigger was. We just moved it. Okay. That works. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Okay, Amy, is there anything else you have or do we turn it back over to chance? That's all I had. I just wanted to give give everybody the highlights and give you a chance to ask questions and let you know the hearings are coming up and we're in the comment period. So if you've got comments, uh, please submit them. Um, we welcome comments on our proposed rules. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity.
Thank you, Amy. OK, so the last part, uh, guidance and forms update. Uh, we don't have anything in regards to forms that we've done. Chance, you froze up. He'll be back, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we'll give him a minute to. I see Can him. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, now we hear you. Um, sorry, I don't know. It said it put me on hold. It's probably something that has to deal with being in the country. Who knows? Um, I have a country. It makes fun of me. I have the country connection out here with internet. <laughs> so um, I'll just start over. So in regards to guidance and forms update, we haven't had any forms that we've updated since the last time we met, but we did update a guidance document. Um, it's the uh, work plan for removing prohibited waste from municipal solid waste landfill. Hello. That's going to be RG546. Can can any, can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Everybody has frozen on my end. I'm going to turn my my camera off and see if that helps. And continue on. Okay. So um, basically, um, this publication was to provide some guidelines for developing a work plan for removing prohibited waste. Um, that was uh, mistakenly disposed of in an MSW landfill. So the guidance is basically just generalizes some of the things, but doesn't it doesn't really, but it does focus on um, regu regulated hazardous waste and how to dispose of that and class one waste disposed in an MSW cell. So again, it's going to be RG five four six. In the title of that document is is preparing work plans for removing prohibited waste from a municipal solid waste landfill. So a lot of hard work has gone into that. Um, a lot of our well-known names uh, that have been in our section for a number of years uh, worked on it. Kudos goes out to Arthur um, Denny and uh, Brandon Grulick, uh, Frank Zing, Arthur, I mean, Artin Arvakian, and uh, no, and Steve O'Deal. So um, I appreciate all the hard work that went into that. And other than that, that's all I have in regards to MSW updates. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. It doesn't sound like anyone has any questions for you, Chance. Um, just a side topic, any conversations yet in the agency of when you might start resuming uh, some work back in the office? No. None. None. OK. I'll just say my this is Risa. I'll just say my only frustration with working with everybody remotely. It's generally been great with the exception of when I need to get into the files or get somebody else to get into the actual files, um, it's that's difficult and that's caused some delays. Other than that, it's been it's been really quite effective and efficient. Charlie and I had a conversation about files just yesterday <laughs> or actually Tuesday. <laughs> well, I get I get a lot of requests from clients um, and others to you know, research permits and authorizations and figure out what's in the file and what's not and whether it's right or wrong. And, you know, that part is is quite difficult. Um, submitting new requests for authorizations has been, like I said, very efficient. And thank you for that. But um, there are folks, particularly in my world, that have questions very often about what's in the file what are we allowed to do what are we not allowed to do and sometimes it's kind of hard to figure that out for them i believe diane is on a project of 
agency wide for central file room stuff. So files is a big ticket item right now that we're all looking at trying to improve. So thank you, Diane. <laughs> All right, and if uh, does anyone else have any questions for Chance? If none, we will skip over to David Greer with his uh, awesome beard to give us the Recycling Market and Development Plan update. Good morning, David. Good morning. Thanks, Robert, Holly. Um, appreciate the opportunity to come in and give an update uh, as mentioned previously, I'm David Greer. I'm the section manager for the public education section and the contract manager for the recycling market development project. I'm going to bring in um, a slide that you guys have seen before to use as a prompt. Um, just real quickly. Hopefully I got the right picture up. Um, hopefully all you're seeing is the approach graphic. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Perfect. Um, so you, you've seen this before. Uh, I know Scott has presented this slide as an update in the past. Um, figured I'd use this for talking points on where we're at in the project. So the project's coming along uh, really quite well. Um, we are just, as we had mentioned last fall, we had gotten behind on schedule just a little bit due to the impacts from the pandemic, um, but we made good progress and, and had started to close that gap. Um, so where we're at right now, the subcontractor is, is reaching out to specific entities throughout the state to identify resources for increasing recycling and uh, purchases of recyclable materials. So that is ongoing right now. Um, I, I, I look at that as being box number five down there. We're making good progress moving forward. The other thing that we're looking at right now is the um, beginning pieces of the recycling education component of the, the contract. So we're looking at materials development that we can use in the recycling education side of things. Um, we are reviewing the materials that are coming through and anticipating this project being complete in um, June timeframe. So about three more months and we'll have this thing uh, complete and ready for a complete review and, and publication. So. If anybody has any questions about how it's going or items, I'd be happy to refer you to the appropriate resources uh, or answer your questions as I can. Not hearing any questions. Sounds great. <clears throat> Keep moving along then. Appreciate it. All right, and if there's no questions for David, is there anything else you want to add, David, before we let you go? Just thanks. Very good. Well, we'll uh, move along then to our next topic, the 2018-2019 Regional Solid Waste Grants Funding Report. And we've got a couple of, uh, of uh, speakers going to present that. Uh, Aaron Livingston and Kimberly Dowdy are I don't know who's going to go first. Erin, is that you? Uh, yes, I'm going to go first and I'm going to share my screen. Um, so hopefully it will work just fine. All right. Are y'all seeing the presentation? Yes. OK, and you should see just the correct presentation now. So OK. So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I am Erin Livingston. I'm with the Houston Galveston Area Council, and I'll be giving the presentation today. I am joined by Kimberly Lyle Dowdy. She's with the Texas Association of Regional Councils, and y'all have heard from her in years past on this uh, this report, and she is here to answer any questions that are better suited for her. So um, she'll be participating at the end if y'all have questions. 
So today I'm going to be talking about the Regional Solid Waste Grants Program Legislative Report, but I would like to start off by giving you just a bit of background information. Some of you may know all of this, but I'm guessing that there's somebody who doesn't. In 1989, the Texas Legislature signed into law the Solid Waste Disposal Act. In that act, there are two things regarding councils of governments that are relevant to the topic today. Number one, councils of governments are to fund local and regional solid waste grants. And number two, councils of governments are to issue a biennial report to the Texas legislature detailing how they've spent those funds. At the same time that the Solid Waste Disposal Act became law, they also set up the funding source for councils of governments to be able to accomplish these things. All the work that COGS do related to solid waste is funded by the tipping fees at landfills. And probably everybody knows what a tipping fee is, but in case there's somebody who doesn't, a guest or something, um, I'll just give a quick explanation. So for every ton of garbage disposed of in a landfill, a fee is assessed. This is the tipping fee. So 94 cents of that fee goes into a fund at the state. Of that 94 cents per ton, one third of it goes to the Council of Governments and the other two thirds goes to TCEQ. And the amount of money collected and the split between TCEQ and the COGS has changed over the years, but that's where we've been for, I think, the last decade. So every COG gets a portion of those funds and it's according to a formula that's determined by the TCQ that takes into account things such as population levels, um, poverty levels, and other factors. With that money, we're able to conduct our regional activities and then also give out money to the grantees. So every COG conducts their grant application and selection process. The grants are implemented and the results are gathered. And then the final results are collected a year after the grants end. And then those results are used to develop the legislative report. Why is it that we even use COGS for the grant program? Why can't we just use TCQ? Well, besides being a way to equitably distribute the grant funding across the state, there is local familiarity at the COGS. Grant proposals are evaluated by public and private experts from the region who are familiar with the needs and the issues of the region. Also for efficiency, COGS know what activities are underway in the, their areas, and so this decreases the chance of duplication of efforts. And then finally, the ability to implement regional projects for needs that cross jurisdictional boundaries. Now I'm gonna actually get into the report that we're all here to hear about. Um, this report currently being submitted to the Texas legislature is for the grants funded during 2018 and 2019, with the final results for those grants having been collected during the summer of 2020. There were 240 grants that were funded during that biennium with more than $6.1 million given out to grantees. Next, I'm gonna highlight some of the um, outstanding results that were achieved by the grants and they are also highlighted in the report. And in my opinion, and I hope y'all will all agree that the state of Texas gets a great return on their investment. Grantees collected 1.25 million pounds of electronics for recycling with the grant funds. Grantees also collected 1.4 million pounds of household hazardous waste with a million of those pounds being paint. That is enough paint to trace a one inch line around the state of Texas 23 times. Through billboards, radio spots, and other mass media activities, grantees reached out to Texans almost 40,000 times. There were 25 local enforcement grants funded. These grantees investigated over 5,000 illegal dumping sites, identified more than 1,600 violators, and caused the removal of more than 21 million pounds of illegally dumped waste. Grantees also diverted 17 million pounds of recyclables. Here's the final slide about the results. $430,000 was spent to recycle over 213,000 scrap tires. Almost 98,000 students attend a school district that received funding for a recycling grant. And over 14 million pounds of trash and recyclables were collected at cleanup events across the state. So besides the results that are celebrated in the report, we also have two other parts to the report. The first are the stories that highlight the challenges and successes of the grants program throughout the state. Topics covered in this year's report include illegal dumping enforcement, the use of partnerships to stretch dollars, pharmaceutical collection, electronics recycling, and household hazardous waste collection. The final part of the legislative report is what we call the COG highlight pages. In the report, each 
COG region gets a two-page spread. Included on their page is a list of the grantees, a summary of the types of grants received, and then also the COGs get to highlight the project or projects they think tells the best story. I'm going to quickly talk about five COG stories that are in this year's report. First up is the Capital Area Council of Governments. In 1996, the Regional Environmental Task Force was formed to address illegal dumping and other environmental crimes. Working together increases the effectiveness of the members to mitigate and prevent illegal dumping. During this past biennium, a grant was given to help fund the development of a spatial analysis tool tracking dumping sites throughout the region. This helps members determine where additional resources and special enforcement programs may be needed. Next up is the Concho Valley Council of Governments. In September 2018, the city of Sonora was impacted by a flash flooding event from Dry Devils River. About 300 homes were impacted. The city set up three collection locations for the debris, but then they didn't have the funds to properly transport and dispose of the materials. Concho Valley COG agreed to help and provided some of the funds needed for disposal through the grants program. The city was then able to cover the cost for the remaining debris. In total, they disposed of almost 3,500 tons of flood debris. We have the Houston Galveston Area Council. For this report, HGAC chose to highlight the Stella Roberts Recycling Center, a recycling and household hazardous waste facility. This facility serves the residents of the city of Pearland, but they've also found a way to serve those in the surrounding communities that don't have HHW options or options for electronics recycling. This grant they received focused on their HHW operations at the facility. With the grants, they purchased items such as uh, rolling carts to help in unloading vehicles and a shipping container and oxidizer cabinet to safely store the materials until they're sent off for recycling or disposal. During fiscal years 2018 and 2019, more than 49,000 people dropped off recycling and about 2,600 people dropped off HHW and electronics. Next, North Central Texas Council of Governments. The city of Grand Prairie received about $50,000 in grant funding from NCTCOG to implement a plastic and aluminum recycling program throughout Grand Prairie ISD. With that funding, they were able to place over 270 36 gallon recycling bins in the schools. Through their fundraising efforts, they were able to expand the program with 23 additional recycling bins. These efforts included direct bin sponsorships by local businesses and organizations, a classroom competition, and the Plastic Free Planet Gala. In each school, the Green and Clean Campus team took charge of monitoring the bins for contamination and also emptying the bins into the dumpster for collection. In just under a year, they were able to collect more than 4,600 pounds of plastic and more than 1,100 pounds of aluminum. And then finally, we have the South Plains Association of Governments. In the legislative report, SPAG chose to highlight two grants this biennium. The first was a grant to the City of Plainview for the purchase of a portable conveyor and a stationary trauma screen to more quickly move materials off the floor at the recycling center. The City of Plainview has operated this recycling center since 1994 for their residents and businesses and those in the surrounding areas. On average, almost six tons of waste are diverted from the landfill through the recycling. The second grant SPAG highlighted was a grant to the City of Sudan for the purchase of an additional mini dump trailer. The city has been using these trailers to collect large items from residents and the demand has increased so they needed another one. Residents are also able to reserve these trailers for uh, free of charge for weekend cleanups, and this has decreased the amount of litter and illegal dumping in the city. Items that can be are recycled, and then the rest is taken to a landfill for disposal. In just two years, the city collected approximately 12,000 pounds of white goods, 228 scrap tires, and 20,000 pounds of brush and yard waste. Before I open it up for questions, I did want to quickly mention something that is new this biennium. We have always done a printed version of this report, um, but because of the need to the continuing need to social distance and the fact that TARC is not allowed to go into the Capitol building, we decided to make a um, online version of this report, a specifically online version of this report, because the other one is posted on the Internet, but this one just operates a little differently. So it is something we want to continue in the future. So I'm just going to give you all a quick little look at it. So let that pull whale. Well. OK, we're going to try again. 
There we go. Being slow. Okay, hopefully y'all can see the website. Um, so it is. it has all of the same materials that is in the printed version of the um, of the report. It's just organized in a little bit different way. It's got three tabs. So the introduction has everything that you would find that's kind of an overview of the program. You have um, the tabs right here that you can click to or you can just scroll. It has tables. It has all of the graphics that we have in the report. Um, the topics of interest are those five topics that I mentioned during my presentation. Again, you can click here on the tab or you can scroll down throughout and see all of them. And then the final tab is this regional councils of governments. And so if you zoom out, then all of the um, councils of governments would be listed over here. But if you were to zoom in, then it only lists the ones that are in the, I guess, the viewer at that point. Um, and so then you can click on one of them and um, this has the story it has the pictures that they have on their page in the report it also lists the grant recipients um, the number of grants and the different types and then the dollar amounts that went to each of those types of grants then if they had any other pictures and then it also has a link to their website for the cog so all right, so that is all I have for you this morning. So thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions for us, we would be happy to answer those for you now. Um, and if you want to see the full report, both the printed version and the online version, there are links to both of those on the TARC website. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, as you can see, there's great work being done by the COGS to help ensure the safety and health of Texans as a result of the Regional Solid Waste Grants Program. Um, to those who have not met me before, my name is Kimberly Lyle Dowdy. I'm the Associate Director at the Texas Association of Regional Councils. Um, like I said, as you heard, this program is funded through state appropriations made out of monies deposited to a general revenue dedicated account, number 5,000. And I want to take this opportunity to express our gratitude to this council for their continued support for increasing the funding that is appropriated to this program. Many of you know that there is a balance in that dedicated account. So there is more money being collected from the tipping fee than is currently appropriated to the grant program. Um, but there was a resolution that this council passed uh, last year, and it was considered by TCEQ commissioners to increase the amount that is requested in the LAR, the legislative appropriations request, uh, to help draw down the balance of the fund in a way that ensures that the money is spent for its intended purpose. And that's just one example of a strong way that the MISRIC has shown its support. TARC did testify in front of the commission in support of that resolution um, and we received um, positive feedback on the, the effort of this council, but due to uh, unpredictable budget projections because of COVID-19, commission did not adopt that resolution. Um, in our latest review of the budgets for the next biennium, we are scheduled to receive level funding again, um, but we will continue looking for ways to increase the funding that goes to this program because it does have a direct impact on the communities that each of you are from and represent and on folks statewide. So thank you for letting me share that information. Thank you for your continued support. And if there are any questions, we are I am happy to answer those. Does anyone have any questions for Kimberly or Aaron? Yeah, we'd like to revisit that funding question at some point down in the future when things get a little more in a, a normal range. But uh, yeah, I was disappointed that it uh, didn't receive uh, uh, approval last year. Disappointing, but we were saved from the 5% cut. So we <sighs> see that as a win, right? <laughs> okay. We'll take it. Well, I guess uh, you covered it all. Um, would it be possible if you provide Diane with uh, the, the link of where those reports are and then she can share that with all the advisory council members. That'd make it a lot simpler if you wouldn't mind 
sending that to her and uh, appreciate y'all's time in this, this morning and the information and um, have a great rest of your week. So uh, thank, you. thank you, everybody. We are clipping along here and uh, reaching a point now for, I guess, business from the last meeting. Uh, I think everyone uh, through the email that you got from Diane, you would have received the uh, meeting minutes from the January meeting. Uh, don't know if you've had a chance to look at those. I'll give you just a minute to scan through there. And if uh, somebody is, uh, has already looked at that, if they want to make a motion to approve those minutes as presented, we will entertain that. I'll make a motion to approve the minute that's presented. Thanks, Risa. I'll second. Risa made the motion. Heather second. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess all those in favor, uh, indicate, indicate by saying aye. 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 Sounds like we got everybody approving, so we will approve those from the January 14th meeting. Uh, action items. Uh, Diane, do you have anything on your list? Diane, you're muted. Sorry, I do not, with the exception of the uh, the link for the COGS. Yeah. For the uh, report. And that's a, but there's no no old action items. I don't think so. We we took care of the the only thing that was left from last meeting was the comments about the stakeholder list and y'all y'all took care of that so right. i can't think of anything chance is there anything action wise that you have picked up on no ma'am okay very good i think we're good uh before i go to public comments i'll just uh throw it open to the to the council is there anything uh on anyone's mind that you'd like to to speak on right now or to Make motion or uh, questions to the council. If not, uh, we'll go ahead and open the floor to any public comments. Is there anyone uh, with the public that would uh, like to comment to the council? If there is, if you'd state your name and who you represent and then what you'd like to, uh, to address. So I'll open the floor for public comments. Somebody is talking, but I think they're on mute. Here we go. Sorry. Seems to be contagious. Uh, this is Steve Shannon. Can you hear me? Yeah, hear you fine, Steve. Good, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to address uh, the members of your organization on behalf of the Business Council of the State of Texas Alliance for Recycling. I'm representing the Business Council only uh, the uh, star board has asked our council to investigate uh, a matter and we are in pursuit of that now uh, we feel as though we are uh, in line with our mission to educate uh, stakeholders in matters that deal with recycling i'd like to address this morning a pending senate bill 1276 house bill 4022, which is a proposed deposit uh, legislation uh, by virtue of the fact that the bill uh, has been filed, renders it to be in the public domain and um, subject to public consideration. Uh, and that is some of, one of the, part of the reasons why we're bringing this matter uh, to your attention. Um, the I'll just give a real quick thumbnail sketch uh, about the bill and then um, some concerns that have been expressed by our stakeholders. Um, the uh, bill is an act uh, relating to public health improvement and pollution reduction through recycling. It, it 
creates the Texas Clean and Healthy Program. It has considerable merit in a number of ways. Uh, it is focused upon uh, collection um, and litter abatement, uh, both of which um, have been chronically um, underfunded and need assistance. <clears throat> it imposes a one cent deposit on PET beverage containers, most PET beverage containers, single use plastic bags, single use plastic cups that contain a beverage at the point of purchase uh, and uh, flexible packaging uh, like you would see uh, that a salad or fruit or something might come in. It, that one cent deposit at 2015 generation levels, as was identified in the study on, on economic impacts of recycling, would generate uh, $253 million per year. Um, they have in this set aside $50 million for development of rebate centers. Uh, it creates a 17 member consortium that is represented by industry and various people across the uh, stakeholder spectrum. Uh, they are to cooperate with the comptroller to manage this fund, uh, which is outside of the general fund. The material, the eligible materials are, are maybe rebated for 25 cents per pound, and they are also providing for a handling fee, uh, being urban or rural. If you're urban, uh, you can get uh, $1,200 a ton handling fee if you are a processor or if you're rural that's eighteen hundred dollars a ton handling fee if you are a processor um, it is it also provides grants to counties of a hundred thousand dollars each per year uh, with uh, a, a magnifier for the larger counties um, it has considerable merit. It was well written. Uh, it, it is a, a, a reasonable approach uh, to the issue of capturing litter and helping to prevent litter uh, and creating the funding thereof. Um, however, uh, collection is only one link in the recycling chain. Um, it is a critical link, but there are many other links uh, upstream, if you will, processing, refining, uh, pelletizing, um, and then ultimately manufacturing to be able to close the loop. The bill has um, many expectations for the upstream um, capabilities of the recycling industry, uh, which in many cases currently are struggling or non-existent. Now, PET, we're only we're capturing less than 10 percent of that uh, PET bottles here in Texas. The manufacturers that use that material are actually shipping the material from out of state in order to be able to meet their production uh, requirements. Uh, so that capacity exists, but for um, cups and film plastics, which can contain many different types of polymers, those material streams are very problematic at this point. When the bill became, when it became a bill about three weeks ago, um, it blew up on everybody's um, corporate uh, radar and the Star Business Council was contacted, almost bombarded by uh, stakeholders uh, asking for our interpretation of the bill, uh, its impacts on how it may impact them and so on. Uh, the Business Council has conducted numerous um, conference calls and, and much debate uh, over the uh, issue. Uh, the, the questions that uh, the stakeholders represent kind of fall into three general categories. Uh, one is, how does this bill impact the up, upstream or downstream, I suppose, uh, manufacturing processing chain? Uh, how does this bill or could it 
interface with the recycling market development plan recommendations, which will be out in five months. Um, and there are some uh, conflicts or disconnects between some of the things that the bill's collaterals, the, the one pagers, if you will, are asserting that are not reflected clearly um, in the text of the bill, which is giving rise to con concern. Um, it would seem uh, that there is an opportunity for some synergy here uh, between a collection bill and um, recommendations that would come from the market development plan. However, by virtue of the fact that we don't have the market development plan now, uh, we are unable to examine uh, this proposed bill against those recommendations. So perhaps we're hopeful that uh, the bill might be able to be amended uh, to at least try to connect those dots a little bit better and to clarify some of these uh, questions. Frankly, uh, uh, just so, uh, let me say that the Star Business Council has forwarded a list of 12 questions, which it is my understanding uh, that you have that document now. Uh, we have forwarded that to Texans for Clean Water, who are the original proponents of the bill, uh, and to the three legislators who are currently sponsoring the bill. Uh, we understand this is the 11th hour and 57th minute that uh, the legislature, uh, you know, we're running out of time. I will tell you that I think that there are perhaps as many or more people among our stakeholders that want to find a way to support this bill, that, that are hopeful for it. Uh, there are some that are opposed to it for uh, the usual reasons. Uh, anything new is going to have its challenges and there are going to be uh, changes and, and that is normal and natural. Uh, we are providing this education to you and we have attached also or sent to you the text of the bill and uh, the collateral materials that we have been provided by Texans for Clean Water uh, for your edification. Um, if we, we would uh, enjoy very much hearing from you. Uh, my contact information is at the bottom of the letter in my email. Uh, I, I, I'm certain that Texans for Clean Water would also uh, like to hear your opinions. We feel as though something of this import and magnitude is, in, is important that as many people are aware of it at this time uh, as possible so that if amendments can be made that might be able to ameliorate people's concerns that uh, that that be able to be done. I would like to provide to you my phone number, my cell number. If you uh, feel as though you'd like to call me or discuss this, and that number is 512-871-9442. With, with those things said, and in the interest of your time, uh, I will conclude uh, my uh, overview. Uh, I will be pleased to take any questions that you might have, uh, but uh, would ask um, uh, that you read the documents and uh, consider uh, uh, developing uh, an understanding of it. We are not recommending at this point that anybody take any position. Uh, in regard to it, support, neutral, or in opposition. We are striving mightily to understand the bill better uh, so that hopefully it may be supported. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and I'm glad you uh, wrapped that up for us that way because I was, I was wondering if there was something you were going to specifically ask the council to do, and it, it sounds like, you know, this being in the... Uh, 11th hour of everything there's it, it would come to if there's anyone individually on the council that has any strong feelings on it i would guess you could uh follow the document that steve provided and uh you know we sent to everybody uh, a couple of days ago um maybe send a letter in uh to steve and he would get it to the appropriate uh, uh people that need to be seeing that before this bill comes to pass so 
with that, I'll open the floor. Does anyone in the council have any questions for Steve? Steve, this is Risa. In the interest of time, could you give us a very brief synopsis of the most significant unanswered questions um, that the business council has identified that you think are important for being able to uh, provide a uh, or develop a position? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I would I would say that um, that there are many questions that remain uh, in the processing uh, end of this material. It's fine to collect collect it, but we know that uh, and our stakeholders represent that there these markets are struggling due to cross contamination issues, um, pricing against virgin material, uh, the whole smorgasbord of reasons why these markets struggle. Uh, we are hopeful that the market development plan will address these issues and and offer an opportunity to uh, re uh, resolve and ameliorate these barriers um, so that uh, collection programs like this can succeed. We would I think that it would be um, meaningful to a lot of the stakeholders if there was some language that might be able to be inserted into the bill to the effect that um, the consortium uh, in their deliberations will take into consideration the recommendations of the market development plan and how their um, program can uh, work in harmony. Um, that's that's one thing. The other two is that the the collaterals um, uh, indicate uh, assert that cities that have curbside programs would be eligible for the 25 cent per pound rebate and that their MRF processor that handles these curbside uh, tonnages would be eligible to receive the processing figure of 12 or 1800 dollars per ton. However, it is not in the text of the bill that we can find where it is clear that the cities are eligible to receive that rebate value or MRFs uh, can receive that handling fee. Uh, it's, it's vaguely uh, implied, but I, and that's something that probably could be um, addressed and cleaned up pretty, pretty easily. Uh, it's an important thing to a lot of our stakeholders. The other thing is, um, these, these cities will be relying on their MRFs to be able to tell them how much eligible material uh, came through their facility from that particular municipality in order to be able to um, send that number to the comptroller for remuneration uh, of their share of the rebate. Um, and there are some questions there. I will say that some of the questions, and we presented 20 questions to them, some of those questions probably don't have an answer until sometime in the future, but uh, it is appropriate to at least raise the questions. Believe that there are a number of questions that can be addressed uh, to the satisfaction of people uh, so that they can develop a, a position of support for the bill. So does that help you, ma'am? Thank you. Uh, it looks like uh, there's a question uh, from uh, is Sarah Nichols. Is, Sarah, do you have a question? Well, I was just going to mention um, kind of what Steve just said that I think a lot of the specifics, if this bill were to pass, um, would be figured out in the process after the bill passes. And that's sort of some of the language in there that there's basically a consortium that would be working on putting it together. So. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Sarah. Does anyone else have a question for Steve? I've got a, this is Dave Yankee, a quick question, and I'm gonna, it's two part, and hopefully it'll be very short. Um, Steve, in reading through some of the information and I've read portions, skim portions, I know I'm probably oversimplifying. This seems a lot, kind of, sort of, like a bottle bill. Yes or no? Well, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think that's yes, sir. 
So, um, which, which, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, go ahead, please. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of things here that I'm just going to say from watching this, I, I don't see this necessarily getting a lot of traction in the legislature. And that, that's just my opinion, given where they are. And I'm, again, just a quick question, you know, do you see this really getting traction? Yes or no? Yes. I, I will say that um, that uh, Texans for Clean Water has ver partnered very successfully with Keep Texas Beautiful to conduct a series of uh, statewide workshops in regard to the litter problem, funding issues, and so on. And it, it uh, is my understanding, has the uh, strong support of KTB and its affiliates, um, uh, which I believe are probably, uh, I know, are very active in contacting their legislators and um, uh, supporting the bill. And that's understandable. Uh, again, I think the bill has considerable merit in regard to uh, litter prevention and to trying to kickstart uh, the collection of, of some of these problematic materials. So I believe that it does have traction. Um, we are also aware that there are entities that are opposed um, for various reasons. Uh, we, we, we're not advocating any position at this point. We're simply trying to be able to garner information um, so that we may develop a position to, as a business council to recommend to our star board the position that they might take. Okay. Yeah, and to be clear, I just wanted to say, and then I'm done, I'm not saying I'm for or against it or anything like that. I'm just trying to gather information because this just came up 48 hours ago. So I'm just trying to get a little background because to your point, this just came out of nowhere as far as I'm concerned, or I'm sure it's been brewing and lobbyists had it, but it's it's new to me. So I'm just trying to get my hands around it because it is pretty sweeping and comprehensive. There's a lot here. And so that led to my questions of, you know, probability of success. So I appreciate the background. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have a question or comment for Steve? Well, Steve, thank you so much for bringing that forward to us today. And uh, I'm sure if someone, uh, after they've had a chance to go through and look at the information that you provided, uh, they'll give you a call at, uh, if I wrote it down right, it's 512-871-9442. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That right. That is correct. I, I'd like to thank you for allowing our opportunity, giving us this opportunity to uh, educate, uh, to reach out uh, to your membership. Um, and I hope that you all have a nice day. Thank you, Steve. All right. Is, uh, is there anyone else uh, in the public that would like to uh, address the council before we adjourn? Here's your opportunity. If not, I guess uh, we are done for the day and we will reconvene in July, July the 8th, 2021 at a location to be determined, more than likely this, unfortunately, but uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that we can all get together once again. So, Well, Holly, you should take a vacation destination so you'll be happy of the location you are in when the meeting happens <laughs> you know i might with that don't, you know don't tempt me on that chance i might just show up. and you never know i might even show up in austin you know i'd be there at our office and do it from our austin office so well thank yeah. you chance for um for your update and all you do and uh Keep it moving. And Diane, as always, appreciate uh, you guiding this ship and keeping us all in line. Um, don't know what we'd do without you. And Bria, <laughs> good luck with you and your the new gig. And uh, we'll miss you and uh, wish you well. So 
with that, I wish I could shake everybody's hand and all that. Um, I'm just like I said, I'm a personal guy, and honestly, uh, living my life in a Zoom is not cutting it. But uh, <laughs> it's my prayer that we will be together sooner rather than later. So, with that, have a good rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. See you. Bye, See you guys. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, the me uh, the recording is stopping now. Stopping now. Okay.